So what we're going to cover in the lecture is a brief overview, especially for the new people who are totally new to the NIH public access policy, which we have um, friend called in a friendly way NIPAP. And you can, you're welcome to call it NIPAP as well. And we're going to talk about the National Institutes of Health Manuscript Submission System, which we refer to as NIMS, and I think everybody refers to it as NIMS who is familiar with it. This is the, we'll show you what that entails if you're not familiar with that term. We're also going to talk about something called My Bibliography, which is in a web page called My NCBI that's totally unfamiliar. Hopefully, after I explain it and you're done with the lecture, you'll understand what that is. And we're going to talk about the ERA Commons and the National Institutes of Health Public Access Policy. So the objectives, which I hope we will reach at the end of the lecture, is covering the NIMS system, how to use it to comply with the public access policy. And we will hopefully get you more familiar with My Bibliography, which is the portal that you use to ensure compliance with the uh, NIH public access policy and to um, have the publications in your ER or you or your faculty member in their ERA Commons in order to generate their progress reports, now called RPPR. So here is the policy, here is what's important. What's important about the NIH public access policy, which went into effect April 7th, 2008, so it's been out there for a long time, and um, it's not going to go away, and it is a requirement. It requires that anyone with an NIH grant that generates a publication that has used that funding from their grant needs to deposit the final peer-reviewed version of the manuscript so that it's available in PubMed Central. And it, the important thing, it's upon acceptance for publication. In other words, if you're an author or you're the principal investigation, investigator and the journal says, we will be publishing this manuscript, that's at the point where you should start complying with the public access policy. And the reason for that is often the version, which is the final peer review version, at some point you don't have access to it. So as, as soon as you get that notification, it's going to be published, you should start the steps to comply with the public access policy. And you can find the policy at this URL. And I want to thank uh, Michelle Bass, who is sitting right here, for this great um, image because the one I had was fairly ridiculous. So we can thank her. And this shows you how all these parts of the NIH public access policy are integrated. So one depends on the other. There are four methods for submitting a manuscripts to be in compliance. They're listed alpha, as an alphabetical letter. And you can find that at this URL. Method A is a journal that deposits the final published article. That's the one that you see either in print or online as a PDF. The, these journals automatically deposit those versions of the publication. There's a list of these journals at this web address, so you might want to look at at those journals that are listed there to see if possibly the publication that you're thinking of depositing is there, you will not have to deposit it. The journal will do that for you. And here is one of the journals that's on that list, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. They have been published, they have been depositing final versions of the article for way before the public access policy went into effect. And you can see this indicates that it's in compliance, this public PMC ID. And there's two access points to the final version. There's the one from the journal, which is free to anybody. There's the one that's in PubMed Central, 
and the version we have here is uh, accessing it through the University of Michigan, the MGET it button. When you click on that, you will get the ability to get the PDF of the article. Method B is something you have to be sort of careful of, and especially authors or principal investigators. This is a publisher that will deposit the final published article in PubMed Central if the author requests it. This is not free in most cases. They charge a fairly hefty fee. Um, usually there's something on the copyright which says check this if you wish uh, us to deposit the final version. Sometimes they indicate the cost and sometimes they don't. So you should steer clear of checking that uh, and then get shocked that you've been, you as the author or the principal investigator has been charged somewhere $3,000 or more added onto the publication fee. Um, the final version is that version that is authoritative, it, authoritative. It's the one that all the corrections have been made, all the typeset has been made, all the images are exactly the way they're going to appear in the journal. Method C. This is where the principal investigator or support staff that they've designated to do this depositing or an author deposits the final peer-reviewed version of the manuscript into PubMed Central. And this is done through the NIMS NIH Manuscript Submission System. This is what we're going to be focusing on, how to do these deposits. Method D is a little tricky. It sort of seems similar to method A or even method B. The difference is this is a journal usually in the instructions to author that says we will deposit the final peer-reviewed version of this manuscript for all of our authors who um, need to comply with the NIH public access policy. They deposit the final peer-reviewed but the um, deposit needs to be approved by whoever, whomever the journal designates in that deposit it. And it's usually the principal investigator whose grant is acknowledged. Um, this is a very sticky point here because um, authors or principal investigators assume that the journal that does this, they don't have to do anything else beyond this, but that's not true. Um, they need to approve the deposit that the journal has made. Remember, this is not the final version. This is the same version that you would use in method C, the final peer-reviewed version. So it needs to be approved. So there is a list of publishers that do this and the table of these publishers are at this URL. And you should look at that and see if, make sure that that's one of the journals you're uh, you or your um, principal investigator faculty member is publishing in that. Off the top of my head, I can say that Wiley, Springer, Elsevier does this. They deposit the final peer reviewed. Um, so again, if the journal is not listed in A, which is a journal that uh, deposits the final version, um, then the, you need to follow method C. Mm -hmm. So method C, deposit the final peer-reviewed manuscript in PubMed Central. This is uh, repeated several times here and anytime you are addressing compliance with the NIH public access policy, final peer-reviewed. Um, the deposit is done through the NIMS system. Who can deposit the publication? Who can submit this to the NIMS system? One of the authors of the publication, often especially on a training grant or a core grant, the publication is not uh, something that the um, principal investigator has been involved in. It could be a graduate student or one of the faculty who receives funding from the training grant or the core grant. So often 
the uh, principal investigator does not have access to that manuscript. But someone can do the deposit for the grantee. Again, the important thing is that the acknowledgement indicates the NIH grant funding. Okay? It has nothing to do, if the author on that manuscript has no funding, they need to make sure that if they have used the funding from one of the NIH granting, grantees, that they make sure that they have, they comply or they let the principal investigator know that it needs to be, the public access policy needs to be complied with. Uh, you can designate, the principal investigator can designate someone to do the deposit. You as support staff, if you're the support staff, you may do the depositing for them. Timing is really important. Again, it needs to be submitted upon acceptance for publication. Okay. A lot of people are confusing the 12 month that is listed in the policy as having 12 months. Um, we'll sh uh, what that means is you make it available to the public 12 months after the deposit is made. It has nothing to do with you have 12 months to comply. And the grantee, even though they might not be an author on the uh, article, needs to make sure that all the steps are followed. This is very important for training grants. And all of you who work on training grants know that when you're ready to do a progress report or resubmit, that's when you're going to have to make sure every, everybody who is involved in the training grant or the core grant has complied. So submitting the final peer-reviewed manuscript involves three tasks, three steps. The first one is depositing the manuscript into the NIM system and making sure that the deposit is linked to the appropriate grant. The second task is authorizing the NIH NIMS to process the manuscript and assign a PubMed Central ID number. And after the deposit, the first two steps are followed the deposit needs to be approved. A PMC will not be assigned until the deposit is approved. What cannot be deposited? So if some of you have come to earlier lectures I did, I did not include this, but now there are issues that are arising that people do not know what they can not deposit. The final version of the article in other words, that version that is online, which has the journal name and the volume number and um, the images are the way that they are been typeset by the journal. They are in print or available online. You cannot deposit those. The only way you could do is to call up the journal editor, managing editor, and get permission to do that. Page proofs, galley proofs, whatever you want to uh, call them, they cannot be deposited either. At this point, um, both of these, the final version and the galley proofs, page proofs, are already under copyright. And you cannot, you, have, you do not have the ability to do anything with those versions. Here's the copyright agreement, which actually explains ex in very clearly that the manuscript, once this is signed, all parts of that manuscript belong to the journal, even though it might be one sentence. And this is where there's problems with articles being retracted, because people will uh, include copyright parts of their manuscript in another um, article, another manuscript they're uh, writing. That's fine as long as you give appropriate credit to the original uh, article where the um, information appeared. So this is why you cannot deposit galley proofs or final versions of an article. So here is, and there will be some people who recognize this title, um, here is a journal article. This is the final version. If I click on MGET it or Elsevier, I get a link to um, the University of Michigan's access to the final version. 
I click on this. This is the final version of the article. And if you look down below, you can see that it has the journal name, um, volume, issue, etc., page numbers, and you see the important part. You see the C. That means this version is under copyright. This version belongs to the journal. This version cannot be deposited. Okay? Galley proofs. What are galley proofs? Page proofs. This is the version that's sent to one of the authors in order for them to see what it's going to look like once the final version is, is generated. It's the ability for them to make any corrections, minor corrections, a sentence, the syntax of a sentence is a little not correct. There should be a comma where there's a period, all those little things that can be made before the journal says, okay, now this is how it's going to appear. This is the final version. So it's basically a snapshot of what's going to appear online. Here is what a galley page proof is. This is what you're supposed to do with it. You're supposed to make these minor corrections here. Paragraph return, where you want a paragraph rather than uh, just a set roll on sentence. Um, so these are the little marks that you make on the page proofs, a period where there should be a period and there's no period. This version cannot be deposited. Okay? This version already falls under copyright. What can be deposited? That final peer-reviewed version of the manuscript. Um, that could be a text file of some kind, a doc, uh, DOCX, a rich text format. You could take that version and create it and save it as a PDF, making it easier for you to deposit. Okay, but you cannot deposit the one that's already under copyright. All the figures, the tables, and any supplemental data that goes along with that text file. Often journals will say that we would like it at the end of the manuscript, which is fine, which is it's already part of the document you're going to um, upload. You are free to take those images and put them in that text file that you're going to upload. It's up to you, and you can also convert that to a PDF. Uh, but if they're separate uh, and you don't want to spend the time making it one document, you're welcome to just deposit each individual part separately. And what's going to happen if someone sends it to you in order to deposit, uh, let me go back, you need to open up that text file and do a search to see if it says figure, table. If it says that there's a figure, it acknowledges cited it's a figure, cites a table, cites supplemental data, and you do not have it, you need to get it from whoever is asking you to do the deposit. Okay? So that's the first thing. If your deposit and figure table is cited in that Word document, it will come back from the NIM system saying, please upload figures and tables. But to save you time, you should just make sure you have all that when you begin the deposit. Okay. This is a text file. This is fine. This can be deposited. It doesn't ha indicate the journal information, um, any kind of volume or page numbers. It doesn't have the copyright. So this is a text file that can be deposited. Okay. Here's an image that can be deposited. Table that can be deposited. Again, if you have the time and you'd like to put this all in the text file and just de deposit it as one file, that's fine. Okay, so now we're going to get to how you deposit. Okay. How you deposit that final peer-reviewed version, method C, into the NIM system. So first thing you want to do is the paper required, is it, it, do you need to deposit it? Was NIH grant funding used? If NSF funding was used and DOD funding, or if a foundation funding was used and no NIH funding was used, you do not have to deposit it. Okay? 
So how do you get into the NIH Manuscript Submission System? So here is the URL. I usually sometimes do a search in Google or whatever, Bling, whatever you're using, and do NIH Public Access Policy Submission or NIMS Login. And then you get this screen. And there's actually two portals that you can use. One is the NIH or ER Commons access point. The other is if you are someone who's acting as a submitter for the faculty member, you probably want to go in to the My NCBI portal. Um, you could if they give you their NIH information, their login and password. I think this is sort of, the way I feel about that is I would not want it because at this point every three months that has to be changed. Um, and if they change it, uh, the faculty member, the NIH grantee changes it and does not let you know, you're not going to be able to get in, you're going to try to use the old number and after a few tries and you don't get in, they're going to be totally locked out and they're going to have to contact ERA and have their password uh, reset. So to me that's an area I don't want to deal with. But you work with your faculty member, if you're a support staff, and work that out. Okay. I prefer going through the NIH, the NIM system. When you use the NIH ERA Commons, uh, this is what you will get, and you will log in with their Commons information. Just if you wanted to know, there's also the login for um, NIH um, institutes. So people who are at NIH, for example, they're part of the National Cancer Institute, this m would probably be the portal that they would use. This is the MyNCBI, which still gives you the option of going through these two. Google, I've never used Google. Has anyone used Google login to deposit, to deposit a manuscript? Okay, I've never used it. And the NIH login, again, is the ERA Commons. Um, this is what I would use if I'm helping someone and doing a deposit for them. Where, after you log in, this is the screen you get, and you can read all this information, which hopefully I've given you in this lecture. You would hit the Continue button. And you would get to this page, which is, you click on Submit Manuscript. Okay. It's really easy once you see how it's done. And once you get your feet wet, you'll say, my God, it is easy. Um, the next screen is to put in the name of the journal that the publication is going to appear in and the title of the manuscript. The next, this is what it looks like. Here's all the information entered. You, you would click on Next Grant. This is where you assign the NIH grant to this deposit. Okay? And the way you find out the grant is to put in the grantee's first and last name. You can also enter the grant number here, and you should look at how they want you to enter it down there, the specific way to enter it. Uh, after you've done that, I want to just point out one thing. By this time, you already have a NIMS number. So you're already set as far as proving compliance with the policy. So this was generated pretty quickly. So if you're in a bind you, and you're doing a progress report or you're um, doing a grant application and you need to show compliance, you can use the NIMS number and you have it right here. So then you're going to search for all the grants that this uh, faculty member grantee holds, and you get this list, okay? So as you notice, there is the same grant with different iterations of it. Uh, you can select whichever you would like. This one was selected because that's the number that was acknowledged in the manuscript. So you might as well check the one that was acknowledged. So you can see this is an ongoing grant. That's why you have the dash with the different um, 08, 09. And then you click on Manuscript Info, which to me is not a really good term, but that's what they've used. So here is the 
place where you start uploading the different parts of the publication. So the first is the manuscript, that would be the text file. If you're lucky enough to have all the images and all the tables in that, that's all you have to upload. If the figures and the tables and the supplemental data are separate files, you will need to upload them separately. Um, you need to put in either fig one or figure one. And if you have three or four figures, you hit the little plus and it'll give you another line which you will label as figure two, so on and so forth. If you don't do that and you don't label them, the system will say, please label. So the system is pretty uh, intuitive and gives you all the, the help you need. Again, the same with the tables, if there are tables, and then again with the supplemental data. Often supplemental data is like supplemental data appendix, which is what, how you can label it. You can la label it as supplemental uh, data appendix A plus supplemental data appendix B. So the labels can be as you would like them to be. So after you've done that, you'd click on, you upload the file, and this is the window you get. As you can see, this deposit had several different figures and several tables, and they were all labeled. Why do you want to do this? Um, we'll see why, why you want to do this. And the little box to the upper left shows you how it's uploading all those parts into the system. All of them have been uploaded. You get the screen that says 100%. Everything has been loaded into the uh, de NIM system. This is what happens with all those files. It, and I, I find it amazing that in less than like 15 to 30 seconds, it generates a PDF of all those files you've uploaded. Okay. You can look at this on the fly while you're there and see what it looks like. Um, you can see that the grantee whose grant was acknowledged is the, that box is selected, that little whatever you call it, radio button. And then there's a couple other things. There is this checkbox that needs to be checked. There's this box that needs to be checked. There's also, and you'll see what this looks like here, this is where you put what's called an embargo. When can this version that has been generated with, through the deposit system be released to the public so they can print it, do what they want? So stepping back is the justification for this by NIH is that the money that a grantee uses, the grant money, comes from the public. It comes from taxpayer dollars. So they should have the right or the ability to look at how their money is spent. Okay? That's their justification for this. So here is everything has been selected. The, both boxes have been checked. The uh, release date has been selected. If you're doing something that was published, say, two years ago, three years ago, you can say, issue it immediately because it's already been out there, the final version's been out there for anywhere from a year to two years to three years. So you can say immediately. You can take, make that decision. Um, if it's not the grantee, they have no idea what this manuscript is about, you can select the second option where, um, say, one of the graduate students who received money from the training grant, they can approve the deposit because they have a, an idea of what the manuscript is all about, what the figure is supposed to look like. So you can indicate someone else to do the approval. Hit the approve button after all those choices have been made and the PDF so after the submission is made, the PDF is generated um, and it is prepared for PubMed Central. This is not as instantaneous as getting the NIM system because they have to do a lot of curating, vetting of that PDF, 
Remember, if you think about how many people need to comply and how many people are having the manuscript submitted for them, you can see why it would take a, a while for the PubMed Central ID to be generated. Only the reviewer that has been designated on that screen um, that I showed you previously, either the principal investigator or somebody else who may be a, an author and has an idea of what the content is supposed to look like, they are required to submit to approve the submission. When that is approved, the um, reviewer, be that the faculty, the grantee, uh, whoever has been assigned the approval, the um, email will be go out to the approver saying, please go in and approve the PDF. They will get that email, they will click on the link that comes in that email, they will go in, they will look at the PDF if it hasn't been looked at previously and see if there's any corrections that need to be made. This is the email. This is where problems arise, okay? This problem arises if it's the journal that uh, sit, deposits the final peer-reviewed version or someone else deposits the final peer-reviewed uh, and it hasn't been approved. They disregard this message. You can see the message has from NIMS help at, this is what the email looks like. So if you do the depositing for someone, you as support staff, <clears throat> you need to indicate to them, I've done the deposit, please look for a message. What happens is that it just stays there and it never gets curated, it never gets a PMC number, PMC ID number. Until approval is made for that deposit, it's just going to sit there. And this is where problems come because when they're ready for a progress report, um, it bounces back either from our great gate, gatekeeper at ORPS or from NIH saying it's not in compliance okay, because it hasn't been approved. This is what it will look like. The cover sheet on it has the PI's uh, name, the grant number, the title of the grant, uh, title of the manuscript, the um, grant number. Okay, so there's been some issues with depositing and there's um, that the grant number that the principal investigator wants assigned to the deposit does not appear in the NIMS system. Okay. Um, you can contact them and see why, but often there are some kinds of grants that don't appear in the system. This is fed off of the reporter where all the grants are. What you can do later on, and we'll look at it in the My Bibliography, is assign it in the My Bibliography, the grant that doesn't appear in the deposit system, and it will go into the Commons and it will be able to be used for the progress report. So at that point you can address assigning a, a different grant number to it so that it appears in that ERA Commons publication list for reporting. Okay, so it can be done at that point. Here is the manuscript. This is what has been generated uh, from the deposit. This is where you can make the corrections, either the reviewer, if it's not the principal investigator or the principal investigator. The reviewing is done exactly the way you do page proofs. And you can see if it's, it's fine, there's no corrections that need to be made. The, you hit the approve button. If there are some corrections that need to be made, you hit request corrections and the text will have lines on it so uh, it can indicate on line 35, please X, Y, and Z, okay? Please make comma, commas, semicolons, whatever. So it's the same that an author does with the page proofs. Make the corrections on that PDF the same way. You request the corrections, as I've said. Usually it can't be some big thing like all of a sudden you change the um, science reported there because you decide you want something different in there. It has to be just those minor corrections, 
commas, uh, maybe the image isn't quite good, so you would upload a better image, address the image issues, um, and they're made in real time. So when you're on, when whoever's making the corrections is online, they are made as you make the corrections. Um, again, minor corrections. If they're only minor corrections, um, the PDF will be um, only take a few days to generate a new, better PDF. If there's very major corrections, like a sentence looks really bad, um, it didn't load correctly from the manuscript into the PDF that was generated, the figure is a little foggy, um, there are issues with, I'm not sure that it has been addressed yet, an image can be a bitmap, a TIFF, a JPEG, a PNG, uh, I have had problems with um, an image that has the extension PSD, which is the Photoshop extension. Those do not appear. You get a blank, at least the last time I did one like that. So what you would want to do is go back, change that image to either a TIFF or a JPEG or a GIF, and then upload that again. So this is where those corrections can be made. And if they're major, it might take a little while to make those corrections by the NIMS system. Once those corrections are made, then the reviewer will get another message saying, asking them to look at it again and make sure everything's been done correctly. Okay. So it might be two steps, the original and then if corrections are made, the second one to approve the version with the corrections. So here is a manuscript that's been deposited in, and it has a PubMed Central ID and you can see available on. This is where that drop down menu on the screen said make it available. So at the time this was deposited the release date was to be, this was the release date that was set. This manuscript's in compliance, of course it's got already been released because it's quite, it's a couple years old. Okay, the use of the NIH manuscript submission system to show compliance. So there's a couple ways. Number one is you can show compliance in your progress report in the bio sketches, any communication with NIH by using the NIMS ID or the PMC ID. This is important. The NIMS is only a temporary number. Okay? It's not to be used in perpetuity. It's not to be used forever to show compliance. Um, what happens with that is that the notification goes out, they give three chances to approve the NIMS number. Um, if that is disregarded, it's not deleted. The, the whoever can go in and approve it can go log into the NIMS system, search for that NIMS ID number and then approve it. So then it will be moved out of the holding pattern, it will be processed and eventually a PMC will be assigned. The only three months for use of that NIMS ID. And the system is pretty sophisticated. If it's past three months, a notification will go out and say you are not you need to process this, you need to approve it, it's past the three month limit for using the NIMS to show compliance. Okay. Fairly sophisticated system, I think. So showing compliance, when you cite something in communication with NIH, you cite after the citation, you would put the PMC ID number, you could put the NIMS ID number, remember only for three months. <coughs> or it can be indicated that it's a PMC journal in process. Those are the journals that are on the list showing that they will deposit the final version. You cannot say PMC in process because in your mind you know after you're done with the progress report or the grant application you're going to deposit it. That is not allowed. Some people were doing that, they were putting PMC in process because they figured after the progress report I'm going to hurry up and deposit. So it only can be the journals that are on the list that, the, that deposit the final version. And it's amazing, but in the, and we'll see this in the My Bibliography and the Commons, it will indicate PMC journal 
in process, even though you don't have to. Again, here's this great graphic that Michelle did. Um, it's showing you how all of these things are interconnected, they're integrated, one feeds off of the other. So my NCBI, which is where the My Bibliography resides, and this is where you manage the citations that appear in the commons in order to generate your progress reports. So the notification went out on June 10th, 20, 2010, saying that now that list of publications in the commons needs to come from the My Bibliography. In the past, people were typing in in the table. You cannot do that as of June 10th, 2010. This is where the compliance, this is what's fed into the commons, My Bibliography. So always uh, NIH, ERA Commons, and those people down there say that they've instituted this to make it easier for the grantee mm -hmm. to manage their compliance, to make sure they're in compliance with the NIH public access policy. Again, it makes it easy to track, um, to make sure that the grant is in compliance allows for the association of the citations that are in my bibliography with progress reports. So in the my bibliography there is a color coding to indicate compliance. Um, red indicates that the article is non in compliant. Um, the yellow is um, has, you can see this one's really interesting, this is the one that has PMC journal in process. Okay, so if it's PMC journal in process, that's okay. That indication it shows that it's in compliance. And you can see the green says go. There's a PMC that uh, that citation in the My Bibliography is fine. Then there is the NA, which means that the um, article was published before April 7, 2008 and does not need to be deposited. So don't try to scurry around and get everything in there. You don't need to. It's very uh, time consuming and it doesn't need to be done. Um, the other one is questionable. They're not quite sure. Is it? Um, does it need to be? So if you click on edit status, you can actually go in there and put in the NIMS number, okay, if you have it. So, uh, PIs can assign, grant holders can assign um, a delegate to actually manage their bibliography for them. Mm -hmm. So it would be a good thing for the person who's going to be the delegate to manage it to already register for a My NCBI account. You can do that if you pull up PubMed, right at the, on the blue bar at the top, there's My NCBI, if you click on that, there is a box in the log, at the bottom of the login that says register. It just makes the whole process a lot easier when the grantee assigns you as a delegate to manage their bibliography. So it's up to the ERA Commons holder of the My Bibliography to make sure that they delegate somebody and there has to be at least one publication in their bibliography before they can delegate a proxy to manage the bibliography. So they would go in and on their bibliography there's a box that's hyperlinked It says edit my bibliography settings and they would click on add a delegate. They would enter the delegate's email, it could be at UMICH, it could be at MED, it could be Gmail if, they, if that's what they want to use and then you would, they would click on add delegate. The delegate would get an email saying you have been assigned as a delegate for this ERA Commons holder to manage their bibliography. You would click on that and you would approve. That, makes, that now makes you the person who is going to manage the, the bibliography. And they would log in here to get that Commons, that um, ERA 
um, bibliography. This is what it would look like. This is either the principal investigator, the grant holder, it would have their commons username. It would say at ERA commons. This has to be there. If this link isn't there in the bibliography, it means no matter what you do in the My Bibliography is not going to go into Commons. How do you get this linked? The only way to get it linked is to call down there and ask them to link it. Because at this point now, that is the only way. And this may be a problem with new investigators who um, they're, they have just gotten a R01, R32, and their bibliography does not have this link yet. So, but they need it done immediately. So you need to call down there or send them an email. And uh, there is contact my NCBI. And you need to indicate that the My Bibliography is not linked, who you are, who they are, um, and then to get them to link it. So here is a publication in an ERA Commons My Bibliography, and you can see this one's great. It's in compliance. It has a PMC that has been generated. It has the grants assigned to, to the, the manuscript. At this point, the PI looks at this, it's just an example and decides, well, one of these authors was actually a graduate student, a postdoc in my lab, and they were given funding from a training grant. I want to assign the training grant as well. So they could click on the training grant. What's going to, so what happens here is the PI of the training grant will have this in their My Bibliography, which is great. So they don't have to worry about trying to track it down. So this is a really nice um, image of what it looks like in my bibliography. If you want to add or delete an award, you can do that. And this is where you can add a, an award that may not have appeared in the deposit system. And you can apply the award here. How do you add citations to the my bibliography that are not in there? So you're in the My Bibliography and you click on Add Citation. So there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, the easiest would be to, de to feed it out of PubMed. There's also the other options of manual actually in entering the information because possibly the journal is not indexed by Medline, but it's a journal that's that you've uh, submitted the manuscript to that's not in PubMed and Medline, but funding has been acknowledged. So this can manually be entered by selecting manual citation. Remember, you can put in book chapters, leading abstracts, and all these other uh, options here, and then assign the grant to it. So if you go to PubMed, if you click on that button, you get the PubMed search screen where you can search for the item that you want added to the bibliography. Okay? There's a couple, couple different ways of finding that article. There is searching for the title of the publication, searching for the PubMed ID. A record in Medline and PubMed, have, all of them have what's called a PMID number. Every record in there, even if it doesn't have to be in compliance, has a PMID number. This is like the social security number of the record that's in Medline. If you happen to have that, you can search that way. Or you can use something called the single titation matcher, which is a really handy item, which librarians use all the time, to find a specific article that you're looking for and you don't have a lot of information on it. Here is searching for the title. Just type the title in, hit your search button. Here is searching for the PubMed ID. So you just put in that PubMed ID number and you click the search button. This is the single citation matcher. So if you're looking and you know the author and maybe you know the journal and the dates or the page or whatever, you fill out any part of the information that you have and on this screen at the bottom after you fill out the information, you have to literally hit that search button. You can't hit the return. It won't run the search in, in uh, Medline and find it for you. So what, whichever option was used, the citation comes up. This is 
a citation that's going to be added to the ERA Commons. So you select my bibliography and the person who's managing it can also select that. And then they'd have add to my bibliography um, and they can select if it's their, if they're supporting that ERA Commons bibliography should be in their drop down menu list. And once they've added it, it indicates in PubMed that it's now in the bibliography, okay? Here it is, right there. It had a PMC, so um, it doesn't have a PMC, it has a NIMS number, so that's good. Here's the grant that um, it will acknowledge in the Commons, this grant. You can add another grant by checking here because this is the grant, one grant was acknowledged but possibly the PI wants another grant acknowledged. If this grant doesn't appear in this list, you can actually search for it by clicking on this button and searching for another grant. So you can actually do the deposit for one PI, one principal investigator, one grant holder and actually assign it to somebody else's. What will happen if you assign it to somebody else is because it's a collaborative effort. If you've looked at acknowledgments, sometimes it has the principal investigator, their grant, and then it'll have somebody else's grant who also has an NIH grant. And this is where you can assign their grant to it. They will get a message saying that this grant has been acknowledged in their my bibliography that can accept it or reject it. It's up to them. And here we are. Here's all the information. The grants, it's in compliance because it has a NIMS ID number. Now, um, you can generate a PDF. And I check with uh, the expert over here who's hiding in the corner. Um, why you want to generate a PDF. There are some grant applications that are still not using the RPPR, that are still submitting paper some training grants, some core grants, some U grants, and um, the expert over here, Terry, has told me that eventually those are going to be moved to the um, RPPR system. But at this point, if you need to generate a paper copy of the citations in my bibliography, you would click on that. It would give you the information, um, pulling in the PI's name, first name, middle name, last name, and this would be the starting page of the PDF that's being generated. And then you would click download PDF and this is what you would have. And this is what you could attach to the progress report if you're still doing it in paper. You can see the NIMS number is in this one and the PMC ID number is in this one. Okay. So my bibliography and ERA Commons. Okay. The notification, again, repeating it, June 10th, where it said all of those publications in the um, grantees Commons um, need to go in there through the my bibliography. So here I am. I'm either a delegate through the ERA Commons of my faculty, or I am the faculty. I would log in here. Put in, once you're logged in, here's what you get. This is the, the login screen. So there is the personal profile where you can make any corrections. This would be good if you leave the institution that it's related to. You're at the University of Michigan, then you go to Minnesota. You want to make your changes here. I think there was an issue once where someone didn't do that and the all the notifications went to their previous institution and nothing came here to the University of Michigan because they hadn't changed this in their profile. Okay, And then here's the progress report, part of the Commons. So pulling out in the Commons, the PI or whoever's logging in Commons can do a lot of this compliance right here. They could click on publications. When you click on this link, it gives you this information on the public access policy. If you click on that live link and you go and you're in the public access policy, if you click on 
the NIM system or my NCBI, you will be asked to log in again, but you're already logged in as the principal investigator in some aspect, either a delegate or whatever. And you would click on log in, proceed. And you're back in that NIM system and you click on Submit Manuscript, and now you can see the 14 publications. One needs its attention, which you can address whatever issues. One is being processed, means that there's a NIMS, but it hasn't been assigned a PMC yet. And then there are 14 that are fine. They're all in compliance, they have PMCs. These will appear in the um, Principal Investigator, the Grant Ease, PR, RPPR. I was confused, I'm dyslexic. And if we click here, the part of the RPPR where the publications, where you can select which publications you want in the progress report are in section C.1. I think there's C.2, C.3. Um, this is the section where the publication is going to be selected for the progress report. If you have no publications, you or whoever you're managing their progress reports, you can just say no. You don't want it to bounce back and saying, where are the publications? Are they in compliance? You just say there's no publications to be reported at this reporting time. And this is the place where you report the publications um, for their progress report. Um, I don't know, maybe Terry can uh, verify this. I always feel that a progress report is meant to show that you are using the funding to um, complete part or all of your specific aims and to cite something that you've published um, in 2007 does not show to me that you're using the funding wisely. <laughs> so I would question uh, if you want to do that. I don't know, Terry can verify. This is, this is to me just intuitive. I want to show that I'm using the money wisely. There you go. So to repeat that since we're recording, um, it needs to be the publications that you have not reported in a previous reporting period. Um, so you can submit your progress report if you're, one of the publications is not in compliance, it will give you 10 days to bring them up to compliance. This is where you can scramble and do your deposit and then the status in the RPPR will be changed so that it shows its compliance. So it'll, the NIMS number will be put in or the PMC will be put in if you've scrambled fast enough. Okay. What I what I think, I know this is very labor intensive, especially for principal investigators or support staff, but I think that they're making it fairly forgiving for you to make sure you're in compliance. Um, that's my feeling, but maybe it's because I'm not nailed to the wall and have to scramble. But it seems to me that they really are giving you a lot of leeway here. I know you can disagree because you're the ones that have to do it in real time. So here is section C1, the publication parts of the RPPR. Here are uh, a table and you would click on which ones you want included in your progress report. Right here. Um, and of course they will be added to your progress report. I don't see one so I can't tell you what it looks like but I'm assuming it works well. Um, we have a guide, which is what I've been telling you here, um, different parts of it, and I think this can be helpful if you get new people in your area who are helping administer, administrate the uh, grantees um, grant to point them to this first so that especially if they, if you say these have to be in compliance and they don't know what you're talking about and sometimes they don't want to ask you what do you mean, just point them to this guide and at least they'll be a little more knowledgeable about, about what you mean by the publication needs to be in compliance and that's the URL. 
And if you see at the bottom here, we had done this, um, we had done a lecture last year, um, and that lecture goes from the beginning to the end. This one I focused mainly on how to deposit. I focused on my bibliography. I focused on uh, ERA Commons because those seems to be the questions and the problems that are still arising for compliance. Now, you're free to ask questions, only the ones I can answer. <laughs>